Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, it's a review of the COP26 summit, and we're going to be taking a look at um, some of the impacts and the outcomes um, from a global perspective, but also from a national perspective, and then also looking down at the sector specific outcomes. So, what really is going to be impacting us as an industry? Just a bit of housekeeping before we proceed. Um, all attendees' microphones are muted. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to add those into the chat and we will um, record those and follow them up after the webinar. Uh, we do like to get back to everybody, so if you have any question, regardless of what it is, please just drop us a note. Um, after the presentation, if you'd like to find out more, um, you could visit the mbs.com or drop us an email at info at the mbs.com. The speakers today um, is myself. My name's Lee Jones. I'm the head of manufacturing solutions at the MBS, uh, predominantly looking after the manufacturing side of the business um, from a technical and, and consultancy point of view, but I have a background in, in sustainable architecture. Um, and also joining me is my colleague, Paul Swaddle, who is the head of technical solutions at the MBS. Very similar role to myself, but mainly focused on the specifying side of the business and, and looking after the community there. Paul is a chartered architect, um, so has a lot of experience in, in this field as well. Um, so with that said, I'd like to hand you over to Paul. And Paul, if you'd like to do an introduction to, to who we are um, as a business, I think that'd be a good place to start. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, hello, everyone. So a bit of background on uh, Big Factor Group, the owners of MBS, and also Glenigan, if you use that platform. Um, our vision is to be the leading construction and property information provider in Europe. And now we're growing globally across the world, too, with other Big Factor businesses um, across the world. There's a number of MBS initiatives that are happening from a sustainability perspective, um, which have been covered in previous webinars, including the Climate Neutral Now pledge on our work with forest carbon in terms of tree planting. Um, but then a huge amount of information and uh, work going on in terms of sustainability across the Big Factor Group, uh, looking at uh, environmental and sustainability policies group wide. Our work is centered around connected information and combining great content with our technology platforms for the design, supply and construction of the built environment. And for our customers, whether that's architects and engineers and designers, or for building product manufacturers, it's helping people to connect their information, enhance the data that they have, and be able to improve safety, efficiency and quality outcomes across the project timeline. So today is very much focused around the COP26 summit. And uh, our conversation will start by looking at the main outcomes of COP26 and then what you need to know in terms of the global implications, the uh, national implications for uh, the UK, and then in terms of specific implications for the construction sector. We'll then consider what the industry needs to know in terms of how to align to some of these outcomes and targets and to accelerate and uh, reach these climate goals and then how MBS can help uh, with that information too. So Lee, let's try and summarize uh, what happened at the UN Conference of the Parties, COP26, uh, in Glasgow this year. Thanks very much, Paul. So I think before we get into the actual specific outcomes, it'd be a great um, idea to just put in some context what, what's been occurring in respect to the climate emergency. Um, so most people listening to the call will be familiar potentially with the IPCC report that was launched earlier this year. Um, it had vast media coverage in the news um, and various elements of the press uh, towards the end of the summer. Um, and COP26 was really going to be seen as the response potentially to that. Now, just in some statistics, the built environment, um, so where we live, the sector in which we operate and construct in, um, and how we, we go about our daily lives living in the homes that we have, is responsible for around 40% of all the UK CO2 emissions. Um, globally, that figure is very similar. It seems to fluctuate between 38 and 40%, but that's... Um, a significant portion of those emissions that are being emitted into the atmosphere are, are down to, to the things that we build. Um, so there's quite a lot that we need to do as a sector in response to that. Um, overall, the, the UK targets, um, the UK were the first country to um, recognise that they were going to um, look to reduce emissions by 100% come 2050 compared to what they were at 1990. Um, so we're currently 20%. 27% less, there's, there's still quite a way to go. Um, but the only way that we can do that is by reducing um, the emissions and, and aiming for something that's that's called net zero. So looking at CO2 per country, you, you'll see in the news about the US and, and China 
um, et cetera, having high emission levels. Um, but what we really, I think, should be doing is looking at that per capita. Um, so um, for how many people there are in each, each country, what the emissions per person are. If you factor it in that way, China's is relatively low. The UK is still in the middle ground. Um, but obviously it's the amount of people that are consuming energy in each region. There's a load of different factors that we can factor in there. Um, obviously the developed nature of, of each country and region, um, but there's, there's a lot to, to be discussed. Um, from the IPCC report, it noted that the global tipping points of, of one and a half degrees C, so if we see a significant increase um, in, in temperatures, if that goes above one and a half degrees C, um, it's likely that we are going to be hitting over two, um, unless we make some drastic uh, emission reductions now. Uh, we're going to see some absolutely devastating impacts, um, regions being lost, um, it contributing to fires, flooding, um, extreme weather conditions, uh, migration, a whole host of different things that are going to um, be seen as repercussions of that. Now, worldwide emissions have risen 60% since 1990, um, and they've risen over 800%, I think it is, since the Industrial Revolution. So whilst there are undeveloped countries that are emitting um, a lot of carbon emissions now, through burning fossil fuels to provide energy, etc. Um, if we look back over that past hundred years or so, it's it's areas like the UK, mainland Europe, the United States, etc., um, that have been able to get to the wealth that they are at now um, has been achieved through some of the um, process of burning fossil fuels in, in production um, and energy use. So um, there's a lot that we need to do, and we need to factor that in when we're doing things. So yeah, I think. For anybody that's listening that's not sure what net zero is, um, what is net zero? Well, some people tend to get this confused between carbon neutrality. Um, so carbon neutrality is effectively the same as carrying on as we are, but then offsetting all of the emissions that we have. Now, at the moment, um, globally, the emissions in, in 2021 are a lot um, higher than they were in 1990. So that carbon weight is heavier. To hit net zero, what we need to do is reduce those emissions, so lower that weight, um, come 2050 to lower than what they were before the 1990 levels. And then only at that point, once we've reduced as much as we can, do we need to look at offsetting. So by planting trees, um, investing in carbon capture technology, um, a whole host of different things that are available at the moment to actually um, participate in through the purchase of carbon credits, can we only then really achieve that, that true balance? Um, the golden aim would obviously be gross zero, but in a productive environment, it's not a feasible concept. So net zero is seen as the best um, solution for now. Um, and it's something that we need to be aiming for. So that's an important distinction, I think, Lee, you know, in terms of understanding yeah. that it's not just about offsetting, um, but it is about the kind of net zero goals. So with that in mind, it's thinking about why COP26 was so important. Um, and realistically, in order to try and achieve those 1.5 degree goals um, and keep the global temperature rise below that, and um, one of the key critical factors of COP26 was to try and keep that on the table so that the most severe impacts of climate change could be avoided. But actually, in order to achieve that, governments and corporations need to cut those emissions um, to zero by 2050. And so that target for net zero emissions is now completely critical. And I guess COP26 was seen as really the last chance for that international agreement to happen um, and for the largest governments to set the course for change. So with you know, the 2030 targets in particular, time's now running out. We've only got nine years left um, in order to achieve that. So thinking about COP26, what did you think were sort of the headline outcomes? Um, well, we've, we've listed a few out and I think the, the, the sort of the main factor and the one that was maybe a little bit disappointing was around um, coal, coal use. Mm. Um, there's obviously still a lot of territories that, that are, are utilising coal. Um, the energy mix in the UK relies on it very infrequently now. Um, if you follow any of the sort of the grid statistics, we, we're actually doing doing pretty well but it's mm. not the case around the world um so i think the the big sort of concern there was to look to get this coal phased out that was obviously um played down and it was um changed the wording um from phasing down i know there was there was a couple of countries that were um not participating in the agreement up until that point but we got the wording changed and some people did um there are still territories that are refusing to to acknowledge the the way to change that at the moment or uh, 
taking any responsibility for the fact that they need to. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, yeah, it needs to be that global effort. I think if anything with, with COP26, the whole premise of that keeping 1.5 alive, which I think was the um, tagline that they gave it, it, it's still there, but it's absolutely on on the red line. Um, we're at such a risk of, of missing things. And, and some of the other things like the deforestation, um, I think it was over 100 countries that, that signed up to end deforestation by 2030, which um, given the scale of what that is, is, is absolutely huge. And it's going to be done in, in eight years time. Now, these pledges are great. Um, but what we really need to see is the actions. Now, those 100 odd countries were responsible for 85% of the world's forests. Um, so if we can do that, I think we're, we're going to be going to be in some um, better places than, than we are today mm. but then it's things like methane pool as well so um it was announced that we were going to reduce methane by 30 percent and i think carbon gets the headline most of the time yeah. because it's the emission that we generate the most of and it, it's got such a longevity in the atmosphere um it's around for hundreds of years um so it, it, it's quite a, a big problem in that way but methane is obviously way more um pertinent to climate change it just doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long mm. so that those emission cuts were there but that 30 percent did it go far enough i don't know um have, have you got any thoughts on that because i think we, we could be going further but agriculture etc needs to be factored in there as well and not just things like yeah construction. and i think you're right about that awareness factor you know so that carbon does tend to take the headlines and you know tends to be the thing that most people are aware of in terms of uh, climate change and reducing emissions but there's clearly these other um, chemicals and other factors that need to be considered um, and perhaps there's not the knowledge or the understanding of quite what impact that would have whether a target like 30 percent is realistic whether it's you know going far enough and um, to make the impacts that are necessary so a lot of the outcomes and certainly the articles that i've read from cop 26 i think a lot of it is around how do we communicate this to industry how do we communicate this to um, the general public in terms of what these things actually mean so it's a good opportunity then to break this down, I think, into those areas that we talked about from global to, to national and into yep. the sector. Um, so I'll take a look at some of the global impacts now. As Lee mentioned, um, there was a lot of disappointment, I think, in terms of the agreement as perhaps a bit of a missed opportunity and that some of the language was watered down and that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees um, is now a real battle. Um, so in particular, um, Simonetta Somaruga's comments about um, their disappointment at the compromises that had been made went viral. And you may have seen other summaries and takeaways from the COP26 summit in the last couple of weeks. But I think importantly, general public opinion, at least in Western Europe, seems to be swaying towards an individual responsibility, that it's up to us to demand more from energy suppliers, from you know, the choices we make as a consumer, whether that's what car engine you have, to the amount of plastic you use, how we hold our governments to task, um, and that that's no longer necessarily solely down to these huge international events where global governments are reaching these targets um, and making these agreements, but that much of the contributions are from corporations that we use every day. As Lee mentioned, um, fossil fuels was a major um, you know, area of uh, sticking point at COP26. Um, and much of our response to the climate emergency will come down to how we support developing nations generate energy and specifically electricity in sustainable ways. Because for many developing nations, coal and oil and gas are easily accessible and the infrastructure to transport and build fuel burning power is quick and easy. And um, there's still reference to phasing out fossil fuels uh, in that agreement uh, when some feared that it would be removed completely. But the members that are still reliant on coal fired power and request those changes to the subsidies for coal, oil and gas. Energy generated from coal has doubled since the year 2000 and there's actually more than 200 power stations that are coal fired currently under construction and that's particularly in those fast developing nations because it's an easy way to generate electricity and there isn't the infrastructure or finance to support zero car carbon generation um, in those places. So one of the hopes for COP26 was more funding from the largest and richest countries to fund a global move away from fossil fuels. Um, and that without that funding to reduce coal emissions by 50% and that target of 1.5 degrees is almost impossible. So with much of this, it's about finance and funding and about how quickly we can do that. So how do we fund a global move away from fossil fuels? Are we making consumer choices that are informed by that? 
And if you are able to influence group level activity in the corporations that you work for, the clients that you have, um, or the manufacturing companies that many of you work for, how do we develop towards those renewables uh, focused industries? The other topic for many developing nations and island communities, the most critical topic was a lack of dedicated funding for loss and damage for vulnerable nations to support the impacts of climate change. You may have seen Simon Coffey, the um, Tuvalu foreign minister, presenting his speech knee deep in water, uh, warning in the most kind of visual terms that the future for island nations uh, like Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, Fiji, um, with the highest point of Tuvalu just five metres above sea level and the shore that he stood in at once dry land. But sea level is, isn't the only factor. It's going to be impossible for many landlocked nations as the planet gets hotter too. So there was an original pledge of billions of funding for low-income nations um, as climate reparations um, and to help them to navigate away from coal and uh, hydrocarbon energy. And so that's going to be a key aim for next year's COP27 uh, in Egypt. But the question remains that should a country like the UK or the US compensate for being able to have developed in our industrial revolutions that are now playing out as climate change in low-income nations? And even then, scientists and economists have estimated that the real number um, is going to be in the region of 500 to 800 billion dollars annually um, to help social and practical infrastructure future proof and climate proof in the next nine or 10 years to avert natural disasters. There was funding set up for something called the Santiago Network um, to build knowledge and help vulnerable communities move away from uh, shorelines at risk, but it's literally a drop in a rising ocean. So Lee, what do you make of the Glasgow Agreement? Um, I think it could have gone a lot worse, Paul. Um, I don't think it went far enough, um, mm -hmm. if I'm completely honest. And going back to some of the comments that, that you'd showed on the on the on one of the first slides there, Greta Thunberg, social media tweet, and mm. um, the, the different um, people involved with it, it it was disappointing and I think there was a lot of people in UK government that were slightly disappointed with the outcome but to try and achieve any sort of agreement at that level with so many people involved I mean I know on the in the press we see the main sort of world leaders your Joe Bidens your Boris Johnsons and so forth joining but there's absolutely thousands of people in the background negotiating mm -hmm. at any one point with it um, and I think to come to some form of, of agreement um, was good it does take steps further than what the Paris Agreement said so that in itself is a benefit um, whether it's enough to um, keep the one and a half degrees alive, um, I'm sceptical as well. Mm -hmm. That's it. I think it's it doesn't go far enough. Um, but there were a lot of positive things. I think the, the main thing for me was the amount of coverage that it got. It's it is now um, without question the most high agenda subject on most yeah. people's lists um i think all the media coverage um all been building up from the rpc report really um earlier on in the year through the, the cop 26 summit itself and everything else that's going on um is is really changing people's mindsets now as a consumer um i might think yeah what do we do here even down to educating your children to simple things like switching the tap off and the brushing the teeth yeah. there's a lot, lot, lot more decisions that we're doing but um even at business levels like do I need to actually drive to that meeting? Can I can I take a, a Zoom call or something Absolutely. like that? And it, yeah, everybody's starting to factor the environment into the decisions. Um, obviously, not everybody is, but the more people that do that and the more the word spreads on it, I think the, the better we're going to be. Um, and I think COP26 served a purpose in that sense. So do you want to take us through some of the national impacts? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think that one of the key things for me was the net zero roadmap reporting. Um, now, obviously the fossil fuel use etc which was a, a global thing um obviously took the majority of the headlines but unless it's it went under people's radar um rishi sunak announced that by 2023 all financial and listed companies in the uk need to produce um, a roadmap of how they're going to hit net zero by 2050 now the amount of businesses that are doing this to date are very very minimal um, mm. mbs we're, we're working on ours at the moment um after the, the carbon emission measurements that we were doing at the beginning of this year um, but looking at it, um, the UN Climate Neutral Now pledge that, that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we signed, I think there's just over 400 businesses on that internationally. 
have signed up to it. So, mm. um, yeah, it, it's a shockingly low statistic, um, the, the businesses that are doing it. And I think um, for me, that was probably the biggest, biggest move um, because if people start to think, well, actually, we didn't realize we were as bad as we were once they've seen the stats or well, these roadmaps start to be developed, then only then are we going to start to see some real change. And, and it's really simple in its high level terms of those three points there that you can see on the screen as um, the companies are going to measure what they're doing, report, and then ultimately look to reduce it and um it's a bit like going on a diet i think really until, <laughs> until you know what the weight is you don't really need to know what you're going to lose and only then can you plan how you're going to do it so yeah um get your carbon emissions on a diet and i think for me that was the that was the big the big one from from a national point of view so you've gone into a lot of detail in terms of how this works in reality and one of the subject areas that's um maybe worth going into a bit more detail is the different scope emissions and and how that works yeah, sure. So um, there's something called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. So in a lot of these documents or um, things surrounding COP26, you might have seen GHG um, noted everywhere. And that's that's what it's referring to, the greenhouse gases. Um, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol has a website and you can go and freely take a look at these. But ultimately, what people need to start looking at is their emissions. And the Greenhouse Gas Protocol defines them into three scopes. Um, so the first one is direct emissions from owned and controlled sources. Now, from a business perspective, that's going to be... Um, things like company fleets, so your company vehicles, uh, you can control those even if they are leased because you decide what vehicles you get. Are you buying diesels or are you buying hybrid electric? Um, how much mileage are they allowed to do in a year? Obviously, that's completely in that business's control. And then gas use as well. Do you have gas um, to produce heat or energy? Um, Obviously, there's there's no such thing as renewable gas. You can consider biomass in, but even that still has to come from somewhere and it has emission factors built into it. So natural gas, um, really needs phasing out and we, we're seeing that um with the the new build schemes um where it's going to be phased out from 2025 i think it is that no new houses can have um, gas central heating in um scope two emissions um indirect emissions from the generation of purchased electricity steam heating and cooling um for any sort of technology business like ours or e-commerce that kind of thing it's typically just going to be your electricity use there mm. um but if you're a manufacturer then obviously you might be procuring steam or heat to actually use as part of your production processes so it does start to get a little bit gray there um, but it's still relatively straightforward for most companies measuring scope one or two emissions is, is really really straightforward um, it then goes into scope three which is all other indirect emissions that occur in the company's value chain so this is pretty much everything that you will use as part of your business but you don't have necessarily any control over the emissions that they generate so this is things such as non-fleet travel so this could be your employees commuting into work and back um how do they do that are they going on the train are they driving a big v8 car or are they going on the bicycle um it, it, it's down to them so but they still have to get there to conduct the business data center use this this was a massive one for mbs mm. um there's a lot of businesses and, and even the leading companies your amazon web servers uh, microsoft they aren't using renewable energy to a significant extent at the moment so there's emissions there that, that people can't control but they are obviously reliant on those services to to enable them to to remain productive and conduct the business on a daily basis um, and then there's a whole host of other things from working from home purchase mm. goods and services waste disposal um, the list is actually pretty pretty enormous with scope three but we just um, give you some examples there on that if people are interested in that, then recently you did the webinar on how to become a sustainable business. I did, yeah. So so obviously me and yourself did, did a series of four. It was a little sustainability mini-series, um, <laughs> sort of alongside COP26, building up to it um, to try and raise some awareness in, in the sector. Um, obviously, we've had a really successful webinar series through the lockdown periods, through the pandemic, um, and it just seemed right to do that. So the first one was on how to become a sustainable business. Um, if anybody's interested in... Um, watching that you can visit the mbs.com um, and go to the event section and it's it's in there um, it's currently on the screen now for anybody that can can see the screen um, and it, it covers a whole host of things from what you need to be doing the things that you need to consider but i'll also talk through a case study of what we did at mbs um, the reasons behind why we went down the emission calculating route what we're doing moving forward what was easy what wasn't um, but also we've got um, our um, offsetting partner which is forest carbon um, 
on on the call as well discussing how offsetting works and carbon credits because that in itself sounds easy you think oh yeah we're just going to go and plant a, a load of trees but realistically there's there's a whole host of legal things around how you buy the credits how they're used etc um, that goes on and then then obviously we've got the other three um, the ones from yourself on sustainable outcomes for the construction industry um, and delivering the water cycle and then mm. there's one on marketing um, which I think sometimes gets missed a little bit and greenwashing is, is a big problem yeah. um, so we got the the uh, competition and markets authority on that one where myself and um, the CMA were discussing their new green claims guide um, so yeah there's, there's a whole host of resources for people to go and look at so I think we've set the context of kind of the global uh, conversation and the national impacts but there was a built environment day at COP26 and perhaps we could have a look at some of the construction sector impacts in a bit more depth as well mm -hmm. Um, so yes, I think that the first thing to note was um, there was a built environment virtual pavilion. Um, now, obviously, with the pandemic um, being in full swing, it was touch and go whether this was actually going to be a physical presence um, at COP or whether it was going to be virtual. Um, it ended up being virtual. Now, this um, was uh, built by the UK Green Building Council um, in partnership with a lot of other people. Um, I think AECOM were, were very heavily involved in, in developing the, the 3D element of it, but MBS were a uh, sponsor of this. Mm. So, so we funded um, quite a lot of it. And what you can see on the screen there is it was a website where you could go to, you could actually do this in virtual reality if you wanted to as well, if your machine um, or the kit that you had um, in your office or at home allowed you to do that. Um, but if not, you could just walk around and there was different areas showing you different parts of the world, what some of the challenges were, how they could overcome some of the challenges. Um, and by no means least the the welcome intro was from Kevin McLeod <laughs> and Designs fame. So it did sort of give people that um sort of familiar face hosting it that they knew so um yeah it was a great great piece of work there and it was a really good collaborative group um effort to to get that up and running uh but the, the uk green building council didn't just do that they obviously had a very very key role to play um on the built environment day um so the world green building council um which uh, is obviously the the larger um organization um for the rest of the globe were hosting um, this built environment day and the UK Green Building Council at that particular point launched their net zero whole life carbon roadmap. Um, so the whole point of this was to make recommendations to government on how we can reduce um, whole life carbon, the embodied mm. carbon, operational carbon in the built environment um, and how we can do it quickly. Um, it was acknowledged that to quickly um, do this we needed to close policy gaps on on net zero homes and embodied carbon um, some of the statistics around that were we needed to look at delivering an interim target a 78 percent reduction in emissions by 2035 now if we think of it we're almost in 2022 that's not far away at all so drastic changes are going to happen in the sector they've got to um, and um, just to to get the homes operational i mean that's just factory and residential things there um 16 of carbon emissions come from the homes mm. um, but if we look at that 40 percent target as a whole um it's something that, that the government really needs to push forward and the, the uk green building council outlined the ways that that could be done so the key expectations of the roadmap um if, if you don't mind i'll just have a, have a quick run through those um if anybody wants to take a look at this um you can visit the link um it's on the bottom of the page but for anybody that, that might be visually impaired or can't see the screen it's the uk green building council's website which is ukgbc.org um and there's a whole piece on there around the whole net zero whole life roadmap for the built environment um the roadmap itself is the first quantification of carbon reductions required each year from buildings and infrastructure in the UK to hit net zero by 2050. So going back to those carbon budgets where we need to be making sure that we're hitting targets year on year, um, it actually sets out plans for that to be done. Um, the roadmap itself um, outlines details uh, for 14 key stakeholder groups. Um, we've actually listed those out there on the page, but for in particular, people that are um, typically customers of MBSs or use MBS as part of their process. Um, mm. Straight away, everybody that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis from a business point of view is going to be impacted by this. So facilities managers, occupiers, contractors, material and product manufacturers, obviously the architects is, is um, a key one there, but things like building service engineers and structural engineers as well. Um, obviously concrete steel has high embodied carbon weights um, and there's a lot of things that need to be factored in there and specifications importantly are gonna be um, scrutinized and, and 
perhaps even change slightly from what they used to be to to make sure that they're utilizing materials that, that meet these demands. So yeah, quick quick overview of that. Um, we we obviously aren't affiliated with with the um, the carbon roadmap itself, but I think personally that was for me the key outcome of the built environment day, um, specifically for for the UK sector. So yeah, take a look at that if you can. That's excellent. And I suppose the next thing to think about is how you know the people listening today and and how we can um, in terms of our customers and and the users of MBS, how it can help in terms of achieving some of these sustainability goals. I think the first is that we've always had a clear focus on sustainability and certainly in my career that has changed so much from seeing you know green technologies and, and the way that the industry has moved to what Lee's describing which is where this is really the, the key focus of so much of our industry's work now um, and MBS is no different that we are now beginning to really understand our own uh, work in terms of the sustainability of the Big Factor Group and MBS, um, but also how we could provide information and help to the industry in terms of educational content um, to help you know, an ever-changing industry um, understand how to achieve sustainable outcomes. So we've got a number of webinars and articles available on the MBS.com, um, and with those, you'll be able to find uh, additional information. And we'll continue to keep adding to that um, and developing a real library of uh, sustainability content. But it's also worth mentioning um, our MBS platforms as well. So in terms of uh, whether you're an MBS chorus user and a specifier, or whether you're a manufacturer uh, with your information on MBS source, um, we're working with uh, manufacturers in particular to enhance data and uh, provide the necessary uh, environmental properties and um, to help develop that information um, in order that uh, specifiers have access to the clear and unambiguous information um, about carbon, about um, the thermal conductivity of a product, um, in order to be able to push towards some of these um, targets. Um, equally, we're ensuring that our content and uh, the information that we provide um, contains more information on uh, carbon calculations, on retrofit, on renewables, um, and how you can actually begin to specify sustainable outcomes on your projects. And that goes for our digital content too, in terms of scheduling the properties and allowing some of those parameters to be used for things like conductivity and new values, um, and eventually into things like carbon calculations and embodied carbon, which we know are going to be more and more critical. As I mentioned, the mbs.com is the place to go uh, to find out more about all of that information. So I guess we can kind of summarize um, some of the key takeaways from the COP26 summit. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of slides just to summarize what we've talked about so far. So there were many positives to the COP26 summit, um, but we you know, still feel as if some of the agreement didn't go far enough, um, but that actually publicizing these requirements and beginning to have the conversation is going to empower change in the industry. And that really it's down to our individual responsibilities. Uh, we must do more to lower our own emissions and we must do more to make better consumer choices. And if we do have influence in our organizations and our corporations, and we have to do more uh, to help achieve these emissions, it can't just be down to governments um, and you know, international nations getting together to talk about this. The construction sector itself is gonna see seismic shifts in terms of how sustainability is talked about and how carbon targets um, are now going to be achieved with those roadmaps um, and the, the need to really begin making better choices in terms of infrastructure, in terms of our materials um, and the properties that allow um, retrofit, refurbishment and a long term view of true sustainability um, across project timelines. And because of that roadmap, um, all businesses you know, that are beginning to start with the financial and the listed companies but eventually how any organization uh, produces a roadmap to transition to net zero. And whilst we've looked at this very much from a UK perspective, um, how do we ensure that that's gonna happen across the world and that whatever businesses are beginning in developing nations and um, that they also have a plan uh, for how to achieve net zero. And finally, that MBS's you know, suite of tools are gonna to help to improve those sustainable outcomes by using MBS Chorus and Source. You've got the most up-to-date um, accurate data and information about what exactly is available in the marketplace right now. So Lee, where can people go if they want to find out more? Yeah, um, obviously visiting the mbs.com, you can navigate through there, but um, predominantly the, I'm 
the main audience that are going to be listening today is going to be specifiers and manufacturers. If you're a specifier, um, visit the mbs.com forward slash um, mbs hyphen chorus. Um, if you're a manufacturer, um, you can visit manufacturers.thembs.com and they'll take you directly to the dedicated pages for your specific fields. Um, or if you're interested in what MBS have been doing um, around sustainability, um, our approach to it, how we've gone about measuring our carbon emissions and so forth, um, you can visit the mbs.com. And if you go to the about section, um, there's a sustainability tab uh, down there and you can click. We've got our um, annual reports that you can download on there um, and so forth. But just a reminder, we've also got the webinars um, on the event section. Um, or ultimately, if, if you do just want to chat, um, feel free to to drop us a note through the contact page. Yeah, thanks so much, Lee. And, you know, as Lee mentions, please do get in touch. We'll uh, be making contact with everybody who's attended today um, and uh, really look forward to hearing your perspectives on sustainability and uh, how you're aiming to achieve um, a net zero carbon future for the construction industry.